lower back or lumbar spine is a complicated structure which bears a lot of weight while allowing movement of the back. There are usually five bones or vertebra that stack up to make the lumbar spine. The vertebra are separated by joints known as discs. Together, the vertebra and discs make up the spinal column, which supports most of the upper body's weight. The vertebra are numbered from top to bottom as L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. It may help to think of this portion of the spine as a stack of coffee cans separated by jelly donuts. The jelly donuts, or discs, have a thickened, jelly-like material in the center called the nucleus pulposus, surrounded by a gasket called the annulus, which contains the jelly. Adding weight to the spine raises the pressure in the center of the disc while allowing the adjacent coffee cans, or vertebral bodies, to move, rotate, and bend while resting on this soft cushion. The spinal column is supported by another row of joints called facets, which are located in the back of the spine. These joints mostly provide stability with bending motions. The spinal canal is located behind the stack of vertebral bones and discs. The spinal cord ends at the top of the lumbar spine, but sends nerves downward through the spinal canal to supply movement, sensation, and reflexes to the legs. Over time, the moving parts of the lumbar spine begin to show signs of wear and tear. This leads to enlargement of the supporting structures that surround the spinal canal, such as the joints and ligaments. As the supporting structures grow larger over time, the space for the nerve roots that lead from the spinal cord to the legs grows smaller. At some point, the nerves are compressed with movement of the spine, causing pain, numbness, or weakness down the legs. Usually, this narrowing of the canal happens slowly over the course of a lifetime. This narrowing is called lumbar spinal stenosis. People with spinal stenosis develop problems when their lumbar nerves are compressed because the spinal canal has become too narrow. This narrowing is worsened when the spine is straightened, such as when a person is standing or walking. When the nerves are squeezed, most people develop pain, numbness, or heaviness from their buttocks down the back of their legs. Characteristically, the sensation is relieved or improved with sitting or bending forward. Many people develop these symptoms when grocery shopping due to prolonged walking or standing. Leaning on a grocery cart may temporarily increase the width of the spinal canal and reduce symptoms into the legs. Early in the course of spinal stenosis, therapies are directed at reducing nerve compression and inflammation. Physical therapy, oral anti-inflammatory medications such as Aleve, Naproxen, Ibuprofen, or Motrin, and epidural steroid injections may provide some temporary benefit and symptomatic relief. However, over time these therapies usually become less useful as the nerves become more severely and constantly compressed. Eventually, most cases of severe lumbar spinal stenosis require a surgical procedure to decompress the affected nerves. The traditional, most common surgical treatment of lumbar stenosis involves making a vertical incision in the middle of the low back, widely separating the muscles covering the spine and cutting the vertical ligament which connects the back of the vertebra and then removing the bone and ligament covering the back of the spinal canal. This surgery has been performed in much the same way for at least the last 60 years and works by removing parts of the roof of the canal which squeeze the nerve roots when a person stands, walks, or straightens their back. There are multiple disadvantages to this approach. First, the operation removes a great deal more of the spine's supporting structures than is necessary to decompress the affected nerves in most cases. Removal of these supporting structures 
may lead to later problems, mostly the creation of abnormal motion or instability between the vertebral bones, which may lead to increasing back and recurrent leg pain and the need for additional, larger surgical procedures later, such as a lumbar fusion. The size of the incision and the tissue opening also cause increased blood loss during the conventional surgery, substantial and unnecessary post-operative pain, and usually a longer recovery. An alternative, newer surgical approach to the treatment of lumbar stenosis is the use of minimally invasive neurosurgical techniques, in which the surgeon uses an operating microscope and places a small, round, tubular retractor through a half-inch incision to remove only the portions of the spinal bone and ligament, which are actually compressing the nerve roots. This surgery is performed through a small incision, usually just to one side of the spine, in order to preserve most of the large stabilizing structures that support the spine from behind. This surgery is more precise and causes less injury to the structure of the spine, far less bleeding during surgery, less pain, and a quicker recovery. Our patients are up and walking sooner after surgery, use less medication for post-operative pain, and generally have far fewer complications as a result. We learned this by comparing about 450 patients who underwent open decompression for lumbar stenosis with another 450 patients who underwent minimally invasive decompression for the same condition. I have used only minimally invasive surgical techniques for lumbar decompression since 2002, performing this technique in well over a thousand cases. Problems are possible with any surgical procedure. The most common problem with minimally invasive decompression is the failure to improve symptoms or an improvement which is not deemed worth the trouble and discomfort of the procedure. This may occur in 5 to 8 percent of cases, usually because the problem identified on the preoperative MRI scan is either not the cause of the symptoms or not the only cause of those symptoms. This is why we are so thorough in obtaining a clear history of the problem, performing a careful neurological examination, and evaluating the preoperative imaging studies to determine whether surgery is a suitable treatment, and if it is, which part of the spine should be addressed. Perhaps the worst possible complication with this type of surgery would be to cut a nerve root while removing bone, ligament, or disc material. Such an event could leave a person with permanent numbness, pain, or weakness into one leg or the other following the surgery. After performing this type of surgery as a neurosurgeon for 24 years, I can report that this has never happened to any of my patients. We spare no effort to prevent this from ever occurring. The chances of a problem like this are not zero, but they're fairly small. The spinal cord ends several levels above where spinal stenosis commonly occurs, so paralysis due to spinal cord injury is not a concern during most cases of lumbar decompression surgery. There are other potential post-operative problems which rarely occur, for example wound infection or spinal fluid leakage through the surgical wound. If a surgical wound develops a deep infection, a return to the operating room to open and clean the wound, followed by several weeks of outpatient antibiotics, might be necessary. We have not seen this in any of our patients since 2003. If spinal fluid were to leak out of the surgical wound, then additional surgery to find and repair the membrane surrounding the spinal nerves which contain the spinal fluid might be necessary. We have not seen this problem in any of these patients following lumbar decompression since the mid-1990s. Both problems are far less likely to occur with minimally invasive surgery compared to open decompression and are much easier to correct if they occur. Proper preoperative preparation and postoperative care are essential to speed recovery and diminish the chance of a medical problem following surgery. Our experienced nursing team will cover the important things for you to know as you prepare for surgery.
You will need a preoperative physical exam within 30 days of your scheduled surgery date to ensure that you are healthy enough to tolerate anesthesia in your surgical procedure. This can be with any primary care provider. Our surgery scheduler will assist you in setting up this appointment. We ask that you stop taking aspirin, ibuprofen, Aleve, and all of their NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories one week before surgery. You may continue taking Tylenol if needed. If you are on any anticoagulants or antiplatelets such as Warfarin or Plavix, you will receive special instructions from your primary care provider regarding stopping and restarting these medications. If you are taking medication for diabetes, your doctor may recommend adjusting your dosages. Your primary care provider will provide you with instructions about any other medications or supplements that you take at your pre-op visit. If you are currently smoking, we will ask that you quit now. Nicotine decreases the ability of blood vessels to carry oxygen and nutrients to your spine. It has been shown to cause delayed healing and poor surgical outcomes. For help quitting smoking, please talk with your doctor. Do not eat anything after midnight the evening before your surgery. You may drink water, Gatorade, tea, and coffee without cream up to four hours before your surgery. You may take medications that your doctor has okayed with a small sip of water. Do not drink alcohol for 24 hours prior to surgery. Most lumbar spine surgeries involve an observation stay in the hospital, and most patients go home the same day as surgery. You should expect to get out of bed with assistance when you get to the observation unit. Before going home, your nurse will make sure that you are able to walk and go to the bathroom, that your pain is under control, and that you are able to tolerate oral intake of medication and food. Everybody's surgical experience is different and everyone has a different perception of pain. You may feel resolution of your pre-surgical pain, but you may still experience some of that pain as you heal. It is normal to have some pain at your incision site and to have muscle spasms or tightness. Some of your pain may also come from irritation or swelling around the nerve, and this can take some time to resolve. Numbness and tingling usually takes a longer time to subside and may continue improving for up to one year after surgery. You will most likely receive a prescription for a narcotic pain medication and muscle relaxant prior to discharge. Under most circumstances, you will be weaned off these medications within four to six weeks after surgery. Though you may need to take these medications more frequently in the first few days after surgery, they should be taken only as needed and not on a scheduled basis. You should begin taking less of the pain medication as your pain improves. If you have long-term pain management needs, you will need to discuss this further with your primary care provider. We will ask you to hold any aspirin or NSAIDs, such as ibuprofen, Aleve, and Celebrex for two weeks after surgery, due to these medications increasing your risk for bleeding. Acetaminophen, or Tylenol, is okay to use for mild pain. However, please note that there is acetaminophen in Percocet and Vicodin. When you get home, walking is the best exercise. You should take short, frequent walks, and change your positions for comfort. You will need to avoid repetitive bending or twisting at the waist, and your lifting will be restricted to 10 pounds for six weeks. Stairs are okay in moderation. Avoid strenuous housework or yard work until your first follow-up appointment. Physical therapy is not typically required after surgery. However, your surgeon will evaluate your specific situation to determine if it would be beneficial. Your incision will most likely be covered by a bandage when you leave the hospital. You will keep this bandage on your incision for about 48 hours after surgery. After 48 hours, you will remove the bandage and keep your incision clean, dry, and open to air. You may also shower at this time. It is okay to get soap and water on your incision. You will need to avoid soaking your incision, such as in a bath, hot tub, or swimming pool, until it is completely healed. Do not apply any creams, lotions, or hydrogen peroxide to your incision. Most incisions will be closed with an internal dissolvable suture that does not need to be removed. If your incision has staples or sutures that need to be removed, 
an appointment will be set up for you before leaving the hospital. Please call our clinic if you notice any increased redness, swelling, or drainage from your incision. Anesthesia, narcotic pain medication, and immobility can all lead to constipation. It is much easier to prevent constipation than to treat it. Drink plenty of water, increase fiber in your diet, and make sure you are getting up to walk. We recommend taking an over-the-counter stool softener, such as Colace or Senna, while you are taking narcotic pain medication. Returning to work will largely depend on the type of work that you do, as well as your specific procedure. You can expect to be off work completely for at least one to two weeks after surgery. You and your surgeon will work together to come up with a plan for your individual needs. Your first scheduled follow-up appointment will be with a nurse from our care team about 10 to 14 days after surgery. Your second follow-up appointment will be about six weeks after surgery. At this visit, you will see one of the physician assistants or nurse practitioners. You should call the clinic if you notice any signs or symptoms of an infection, such as fever or increased redness, swelling, or drainage from your incision. Please report any calf pain or tenderness, chest pain, or shortness of breath immediately, as these may indicate the presence of a blood clot. Let's take a moment to look back and review some of the key points that you'll want to remember after watching this video. First, remember to schedule a preoperative physical exam with any primary care provider within 30 days. Stop taking aspirin, ibuprofen, Aleve, and all other NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories one week before surgery. Also, we ask you to hold these medications for two weeks after surgery. If you are smoking, please seek help to quit as soon as possible. Don't eat anything after midnight the evening before your surgery. You may drink water, Gatorade, tea, and coffee without creamer up to four hours before surgery. No alcohol consumption within 24 hours prior to surgery. When you get home, walking is the best exercise. Avoid bending and twisting at the waist and restrict your lifting to 10 pounds for six weeks. Also, avoid any strenuous housework. After 48 hours, remove your bandage and keep your incision clean, dry, and open to air. Do not soak your incision or apply any creams or lotions to it. Your first follow-up appointment should be scheduled 10 to 14 days after surgery, with your second follow-up scheduled about six weeks after surgery. Always remember to call the clinic if you notice any signs of infection, such as fever or increased redness, swelling, or drainage from your incision. As always, we are happy to discuss any questions you may have at your clinic visit or by telephone. Please reference the Day of Surgery video for more information about what to expect when you arrive at Methodist Hospital for your surgery. We want to ensure that you have the best experience possible and receive the very best care. Thanks for your time. Thank you.